So uh, my name is Monica McCubrey, and I am the Wildlife Education Specialist with the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. And today we're going to be talking about sturgeon. So um, kind of a kind of a very narrow subject, but we have lots of information to cover today. So um, before we get too into it, though, I'm going to have my co-host uh, introduce herself. Hi, I'm Jamie Bachman. I am a wildlife educator in partnership with the Nebraska Game and Parks in Northern Prairie's Land Trust. Um, go ahead and put your questions in the chat and we'll make sure that everybody, any questions you have, we'll make sure Monica will uh, address them throughout the presentation. Awesome. Thanks, Jamie. Yeah, like she said, go ahead and put them in the chat. And then I have some little transition zone that we'll stop and talk about questions. And then also we'll do a question answer at the end as well. So, all right, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my screen here. So um, if you have been joining in on Science Of, I really appreciate all the time and um, all the things that you've had to watch and I appreciate it. This is our very last one for this season. So we'll start back up again on August 26th, um, but this is our very last one for this time. So we'll do a little break. And like I said, we'll start back up in August. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So we are gonna talk about sturgeon today and I am very excited. Full screen, Monica. Uh, there we go. Sorry to interrupt. There we go. No, I was like, it's not going. What's going on? Thanks for saying it. Okay. All right. So I'm very excited today to talk about sturgeon because um, they're kind of one of our, we know about them species in Nebraska, but they're often very overlooked. And they're such a very old kind of primitive species that we still don't know tons of information about them. We know enough to get by and we know how to manage them um, and to help with their population. But we also know that they're very um, threatened and endangered species, not just in Nebraska, but throughout the world. So um, we're gonna be talking about our three different types of sturgeon that we have in Nebraska today. Um, for those of you that are interested, this first picture that I have here, this is a juvenile uh, lake sturgeon that we have. So this is one of our three species that is found in Nebraska. Um, just so that everybody knows, I've never had an issue, but um, you know, if you do have questions and put them in the chat, please make sure that they are on topic and they're topic related. Um, everyone just kind of be nice to each other. Otherwise we do have the right um, to remove you and Jamie will not hesitate to remove you, so. All right, um, and again, just wanna let everybody know I am by no means an expert in any of these subjects that I have done for Science Of. Um, I'm very interested in these subjects and I do a lot of research and I ask a lot of questions to the people that, that are experts in them. So if you have questions that I can't answer or don't have a good enough answer, I will um, get back to you and talk to someone that can answer those questions for you. So um, this actually is one of the, the animals that we're gonna be talking about today. This, this is a pallid sturgeon that I'm holding up here probably one of the coolest um, fish that I've ever had the chance of holding. They're very, very cool animals and we'll talk about them later. All right, so just a little introduction about what these animals are, where do they come from, how do they evolve. Um, so sturgeon are in the Acipenseridae family, which in this family, it was kind of hard to find an exact number. I saw anywhere from 25, 27, 29 species in there. So anywhere, I guess, from 25 to 29. Um, and they're not all sturgeon. So there are some um, paddlefish that are very, very closely related to these animals. They look very different. They have that really long kind of rostrum or that nose piece on there as well. Um, so very, very similar characteristics that make them um, in that same family. So, um, but all sturgeon, no matter where they are, um, they are mostly in the temperate waters, kind of in the northern hemisphere. So this could be anywhere from Russia and Bulgaria to the Atlantic. There's some in California, but they do like the, that northern hemisphere area of the world. Um, most of them live in the ocean, but as you know, in Nebraska, we do not have an ocean. We have fresh water. So there are exceptions to that. We have three of them here in Nebraska that um, do not obviously go in any saltwater areas. Um, and a lot of them that do live in areas that are saltwater, um, what they will do is they will spawn in the spring and summer, um, usually in freshwater areas. So um, few of them are confined to freshwater. Like we talked about, we have three of them in Nebraska that are confined. Um, and like I said, they're very closely related to their paddlefish family. Um, the fossils of sturgeon have come back anywhere from um, 174 to 163.5 million years ago. So they predated dinosaurs. Um, they're very old. They look like dinosaur fish. Um, and a lot of people think that they have 
evolved from these other forms, um, which first appeared about 419 million years ago. Um, and these sturgeon, um, they haven't changed a lot over time. So they have these very ancient looking bodies, these small little eyes, they have those almost like pokey looking um, spikes down their back. And we'll talk all about that today. All right, so sturgeon in general, um, they're going to have, they don't have scales. When we think of a typical fish like a carp, they have scales on them. These guys have scoops or they're called bony plates. So if anyone is a reptile person out there, you know that when we talk about reptiles, we talk about things like scoots and things like alligators and crocodiles and also like in our turtle species. So they're kind of similar to that. They're more bony protrusions than they are actual scales. Um, and then no matter what type of sturgeon they are, they have five long, rows of plates down their back. So if you look at this photo here, um, you can see these long rows of scales or sorry, scoots that go all the way down their back. They have five of those throughout the body. They also, they do not have teeth, but instead they have this kind of protrusible mouth. It looks like a little elevator that comes down and goes back up. Um, and then they also have these barbels. So you might be kind of familiar with catfish and their whiskers. They're the same concept. So it just kind of depends on the species, but they will have different looking barbels, different shapes, different lengths, um, but they all have these sensory tactile barbels. They also have a very long torpedo shaped body. Um, they're usually bottom dwellers and they will suck up things from the bottom. Um, some sturgeon can grow extreme lengths like the beluga sturgeon in Russia. They can get up to 12 feet long. Um, and then oftentimes being such a primitive and large fish um, require on average, no matter what species of sturgeon it is, they require on average about eight to 12 years to reach that sexual maturity. So it takes them a while to reach that. And if you're thinking about it and you're thinking about being a biologist, you know that that can cause a lot of issues because it takes at least eight years for them to reproduce. So um, a lot of sturgeon are endangered or threatened in the United States and in the world. All right, so when we talk about world species, there's a lot of sturgeon. There's common old world sturgeon that live in the Scandinavia area. Um, there's the Russian sturgeon, which is found in Russia. Um, the beluga sturgeon, what I talked about, and the Chinese sturgeon, you can find those in like the Black and the South China Sea and the Caspian Seas. Um, lake sturgeon is one of the um, species that we have here in Nebraska. It's not as common as things like the shovel nose sturgeon or the pallid sturgeon. Um, they just start to kind of come up very extreme southeast Nebraska um, along the Missouri, um, but they are found in North America, Mississippi River Valley. You can find them in the Great Lakes and all the way up into Canada. We have things like the Sacramento sturgeon, which I talked about. They live on that California coast, the Pacific area, the shovel nose, the pallid sturgeon, which is actually endemic to the waters of the Missouri. So which means that it is found nowhere else except the Missouri and the lower Mississippi River basins. So there's quite a few species of sturgeon out there. All right, so when we talk about Nebraska sturgeon, we have three species. We have this top one right here, which is a pallid sturgeon. Um, we'll talk about how to tell the differences here as well. Um, so pallid sturgeon are a little bit more white in color. They usually get a lot larger than things like the shovel nose sturgeon, which are very kind of comparable. If you hold them side by side, you really have to know what you're looking for. Uh, the barbels are gonna be a little bit different, um, leaf shaped, they're kind of in a curvature pattern and these two inner ones are going to be a little bit smaller. Uh, the shovel nose sturgeon in Nebraska, they don't get very big, about five, six pounds. Um, they're a little bit more pinky in color or gray. Um, their barbels are going to be a little longer and they're arranged in a straight pattern. And then we also have something called the lake sturgeon. So in Nebraska, this is the one I said that kind of barely just gets up into the Missouri. Um, they look a lot different when they're little. This is actually a juvenile one. Um, they have these kind of peppered black spots in the saddle um, colors on their body. Um, but these are our three sturgeon. We have pallid sturgeon up here on top. This middle one is the shovel nose. And then the bottom one is the lake sturgeon. All right, I think I saw the chat. Do we have any? question or anything like that yet um i don't think so do you know for sure if sturgeons is plural is with an s i did look it up i think it's with an s i would just not a scientific yeah. more of a grammar question yeah <laughs> i don't know i just assume it's sturge i don't know sturgeon sounds good but also sturgeon sounds good so if you looked it up i'm, I'm sure you're right jamie i'll go with sturgeon <laughs> so other than that 
Keep going, Monica. Awesome. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to kind of go through some of these that we have in Nebraska here, and we're just going to talk a little bit about how to identify them. And then we're also going to talk about some management and outlook that Nebraska Game of Parks has done, a very cool study that's gone on that went on for 11 years. And then also just a little bit about why these animals are in such danger. So, all right, we're going to start with the shovel nose sturgeon. So, shovel nose sturgeon, these guys are going to be not as large as our pallid sturgeons in Nebraska. Um, so they are one of the smallest uh, sturgeon species that we have in North America. Very similar looking to a pallid. Um, if you have these two together, especially when they're younger, they look very similar to each other, but there are certain ways you can identify them. Um, these guys, like the name suggests, the shovel nose, they have a shovel-like nose, um, and they have these very pale bony plates that go down the length of their body. Like every other sturgeon, they have this kind of sucker shaped mouth that has this protrusible elevator thing that goes out and in and out and in. They have the barbels on them, um, which makes them easy to identify when you look at them and we'll show the difference here later on. Um, but they also are those bottom dwellers. They vacuum up stuff from the bottom um, and their tail, um, when you look at it, it also has armored kind of plates on it as well. All right, it's really hard to get some good sturgeon pictures, so I tried my best, but um, when you look at their tail, um, the upper lobe is a little bit longer um, and it is kind of shark-like. It looks very shark-like. Um, these guys, when they're younger especially, they have this very, very long, almost like a filament and a light bulb um, thread that is attached to the end of their tail. So um, oftentimes as adults, it breaks off um, and then uh, they don't regrow it. Um, so these guys, so when you find one and you see this really long filamentous tail, you know that that's probably a younger one. Um, the color is very variable. It is not a great way to, I tell people to identify animals um, because they, you know, they could be melanistic. They're lacking that pigment or they could be albino. They have too much pigment. There's a lot of different things that they could be. Um, but usually they are dark tan to a gray or even sometimes a yellowish green color on the bottom. Um, they're very smaller in size compared to a pallid sturgeon. Like I said, they rarely exceed five pounds in Nebraska. Um, I think the record was like six or seven I saw earlier yesterday, I guess. Um, the belly of the adults are completely covered with bony plates. The little bit different in pallids, they're a lot more smooth. And then in shovel nose sturgeon, all four barbels are in a line. So if you would flip him over on his back and look by his mouth, all the barbels are gonna be in a perfect straight line. All right, so it's kind of hard to see here, but here's these barbels, here's their um, rostrum, this is their gills, this is the operculum that covers their gills. These guys really like murky or muddy waters. They're usually found in very strong currents and deep channels at the bottom of larger rivers. They often do not like quiet rivers and lakes because they often have dams and this restricts their movement and they don't like that. Um, but they do like very muddy deep water, um, usually about six and a half to 23 feet deep. Uh, these guys don't move a ton, um, usually just to spawn. They're mostly sedentary. Um, they do, studies have found that they exhibit some homing behavior. So when they go um, somewhere, they can find their way back home. Um, they frequent areas downstream in really high water stages. And then during low areas of water, they go mid-channel. They want the deepest area that they can find. All right, they're opportunistic feeders. So they pretty much eat anything that they can get their um, jaws on. They'll eat aquatic insects, they'll eat mussels, worms, crustaceans. Um, the spawning time will occur um, about now, actually April through early July, depending on where they're living and what species it is. Um, spawning over rocky areas and flowing water. It has to be between 66 and 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, they swim near the surface during spawning. So oftentimes people say they they look shark-like when they see them. That's probably a sturgeon. Uh, these guys, like other sturgeon, they're very, um, it takes them a long time to reach that sexual maturity. These guys are fairly quick. Males will sexually mature about five years old. Females will sexually mature around seven. They also do not spawn every single year, at least not the females. Um, they usually have a cyclical pattern that every two to three years or every three to five years, depending on the species. Um, but they are known to hybridize with our pallid sturgeons that we we have, which again creates a multitude of problems um, because pallid sturgeon are endangered, shovel nose are not. Um, 
And basically what's happening is that these two species have been forced to share spawning sites and they oftentimes will get confused or they they look so similar alike that oftentimes they will hybridize with each other. So often when I've seen a hybridized pallid shovel nose sturgeon, they'll have some characteristics of the shovel nose, but some characteristics of the pallid. So it, it kind of just is like a crapshoot on what you're going to see. All right, so historic and present range. This is one of our sturgeon that really has not lost a ton, uh, has not had a huge range reduction compared to things like our pallid sturgeon or our lake sturgeon. Um, although there's been a lot of channelization with our rivers, a lot of construction of dams um, that's really led to, it restricts their movement. So they have not had as much historic range as possible. Um, they are mostly, they are strictly a freshwater species. Um, and historically they were found throughout most of the Mississippi and the Missouri. Now they're a little reduced by that. Um, they're mostly found in the channels, like I said, and they really like gravel and rock substrate. So um, the Missouri is a great place for them. All right, so human uses. Um, one of the things that people do in Nebraska, you can fish and angle for um, uh, shovel nose sturgeon. Um, a lot of people will eat the meat. Um, when you smoke it, it's a delicacy. It's very good to eat. Um, sometimes if you find the caviar, people will eat that. So the fish eggs. Um, there's really no commercial interest in it, but I, I did see some people said that it was great to eat. So um, some people individually will eat it, but there's no commercial harvest for it. Uh, a lot of people though have talked about having shovel nose sturgeon in aquariums. Um, if you ever want to see and touch one of these guys, you can go up to SRAM. Um, the education center has a big touch tank there and you can actually touch these sturgeon. It's a really cool thing. Um, one of the things that they will also use these for, um, in Nebraska, I don't think they have used them yet, but in some areas they're trying to raise mollusks. Um, or mussels. And what they will do is they will actually implant the larva of the mussels onto the gills of the fish. And then when they get old enough, they will drop off. It does not hurt the fish um, into the water. And then the mussel will then grow in the bottom of the river. So this is one of the species that they use for that um, mollusk or the mussel harvest. Um, they are managed just depending on where they're found by the State Conservation Agency, which for Nebraska would be Game and Parks. Um, in Nebraska, the limit, the bag limit is 10, possession is 20. Um, so there's no harvest at all um, ever on the Missouri River upstream from the big, from the mouth of the Big Sioux River. Um, however, a lot of people will um, fish for these guys during certain times. You just can't do it in this area. All right, so that was our shovel nose sturgeon. We'll move on to our lake one here. Um, hey, Monica, do you know what that long filamentous thread at the end of the tail is for? I never really saw a use for it. It was just I try, I have been looking yeah. for, like, while you were talking, I was trying to find that answer and I couldn't find anything either. So yeah, I never okay. read anything Sorry. about why they have it. It's just the juveniles will have it and then oftentimes it falls off. And I've seen it before too. And I have no idea why it's there. That's a really good question. So awesome. All right. So we're going to move on to our lake sturgeon here. This is the one that's kind of found just in the southeast part of Nebraska. Um, so these guys, like other sturgeons, they have this elongated body. The rostrum is longer in adults than it is in juveniles. Um, one thing about these guys is that the tip is slightly upturned. So almost like a hognose snake. Um, it's barely upturned, but you can see it a little bit. Um, these guys have two sets of barbels that are closer to the tip of the snout instead of back farther by the mouth, like in the other shovel nose or the pallid sturgeon. Um, it's larger in adults. Their armor is super extensive in juveniles. If you look at this photo here, you can see these little projections in these spines. There's a lot of projections and a lot of spines on this little guy. Um, and then once they are kind of hit that maturity rate, they basically reabsorb these scoots um, and they pretty much dis disappear um, in large individuals. The body coloration is super variable. Um, it's typically this dark brown color here. Um, you can kind of see there's a little bits of black and saddlebag kind of shapes here. Um, they're slate gray, um, rarely black, but it does happen. Um, juveniles also have larger black areas and black spots, and they kind of disappear as they, they come of age in adult sturgeon. 
So here's a bunch of juveniles. You see these really long projections here, the really spiny um, areas on their back. They also have all these black spots on them. So this is a bunch of these little juvenile um, pallets, or sorry, lake sturgeons. Um, these guys also have a toothless mouth. They use those sucking protrusible mouths. They have the barbels. Um, these guys have a very variable like physical characteristic depending if they're juveniles or if they're adults. Um, they have these hooked spines and if you look really closely, um, you can see how their, um, their rostrum or their nose area, that bill kind of goes upward um, and the other two species, they do not have that. These guys also will have that long kind of filament on their tail. Again, I don't know why, but they do. They have very small eyes, they have a white belly these guys get very big. Um, they can reach about six feet, sometimes even eight feet long. They can weigh 200, 300 pounds. Ones that get to be that big are very, very old. They say that sometimes the two, 300 pounds ones can get to about 100 years old. So they live a very long time. All right, so like I said, these guys get fairly large here, um, bigger than our shovel nose that we talked about. Um, these guys, however, are very late as far as sexual maturity rate. So 14 to 16 years for males. For females, 24 to 26 years. So you're 25 years old before this fish is even able to sexually mature for a female. Males, they only spawn annually or sometimes biennially. It just depends. Females will spawn on a cycle of every three to six years. So not only does it take them 25 years to reproduce, they only do it every three to six years. So they form a very small amount of eggs at a time. Usually these guys will spawn from April to late June. The females, though, when they do spawn, they lay eggs. They lay a lot of eggs, so two to three million in one season, depending on how large they are and um, the size and the age of this animal. And then after spawning, the eggs are kind of left. They're sticky. They're encased in this jelly-like substance, and they stick to plants and stones and gravel. And then once they hatch, they're on their own. Um, they're very small. Um, if you've ever seen a picture of caviar, that's what they look like. All right, um, so these guys, um, when we talk about their food, um, when you talk about any sturgeon in general, the European languages refer to the word sturgeon is called the stirrer, which makes sense because they go around the bottom and they stir up the mucky, murky parts and they eat the stuff that they find. Um, the barbels are like a sensory organ. They help animals find the food and they figure out what it is when they do find it. So they know the difference between like a crustacean and a rock. Um, the barbels, um, they will use these to find their food and then the mouth will drop down and suck it up and then they suck their mouth back in. These are one of the few fish in the world to have taste buds on the outside of their mouth. Other fish, like normal, they're on the inside of the mouth or on the tongue. Um, these basically help in the selection of food. So these guys will eat really slow and they can actually survive several weeks without eating, period. So that is very helpful if there's a very low supply of food. They'll eat things like insect larvae, worms, crayfish, snails, other small fish as they get bigger. All right, so these guys, um, lake sturgeon are listed as either a threatened species or an endangered species in 19 out of the 20 states where they are originally found in the United States. There's only one state where they're not. And I do not ask me what it is because I, I do not know actually. Um, so in Nebraska, they are for sure listed as a threatened species, a state threatened species. Um, basically what's happened to them, there's lots of non-moving water. There's an abundance of non-native fish um, which compete with these animals. There's changes in river flow. All of these things are contributing to the decline of their population. And not just specifically their population, but it also affects the food source for these animals at all different life stages, whether they're a fingerling or a juvenile or an adult, it, it really affects their food. Um, they're also, their biggest thing is habitat decline and they have very rep poor reproductive success. So we talked about those females, it takes them 25 years maybe to reproduce and then they only do it every three to six years. Um, if you add that on to habitat loss, non-native fish, not enough moving water, it's a very hard time to be a sturgeon. Um, they think that the sturgeon that are out there now, they already have a hard time finding a mate. Um, they're reproductively, ones that are reproductively mature today were all spawned before the construction of those dams. And basically they're nearing the end of their life. So we need to get more younger species in there right now. All right, so that was our 
Blake Sturgeon. Um, okay, thank you, Jamie. It looks like that, that filament is used to orient the young fish to calmer layers of water um, so that they can kind of, they can survive. All right. Um, does anything eat sturgeon eggs? I'm sure there's something that eats them. Um, I bet some different types of fish would eat them. Probably not in my just like thinking, there's probably not a lot that, that eats them besides other fish that are in the water. Since especially like the lake sturgeon, they're sticky and they adhere to different things. Um, but again, I, I'm not sure. All right, is that it? What type of sturgeon did I get tattooed? It is a pallid sturgeon, yes. We'll just, we'll talk about them right now, actually. I'm super excited to talk about pallid sturgeon. All right, so pallid sturgeon are my favorite out of the sturgeon species, um, just because they're they're beautiful animals. Um, they're super dinosaur-like when you look at them. They look very similar to a shovel nose. They're one of the largest freshwater fish in North America. They can get anywhere from 30, 30 to 60 inches and weigh up to about 85 pounds. So um, there's even been reports of 100 pound ones. So they're very pale in color though. Like if you took a shovel nose and a pallid sturgeon together, the shovel nose is going to be a little bit more gray or pink and then usually as they age they turn whiter so um, they're very pretty white fish if you remember that photo at the very beginning when I said I'm no expert they are pretty white so that's probably a very old fish um, juveniles are very easily confused with shovel nose because they're pretty much the same color when they're little they have this long flat snout, long slender tail. Um, their body has these five longitudinal rows of scoots. They don't have any teeth like those other sturgeon species. And again, they have that protrusable mouth used for sucking in food. Um, so their tails, um, one thing that's really neat about all sturgeon is that their top fin is gonna be longer than the bottom fin. So when you look at their lobed tail, the top is gonna be longer than the bottom. Um, for instance, when we, uh, people would used to do, biologists would um, take DNA samples, they would literally cut the top part of the fin. And that sounds really terrible, but it's just like you cutting your fingernails. So um, it's that cartilaginous feel. Yes, the fish probably feels it a little bit, but it is a great way to get that DNA for those fish. All right. Um, the upper lobe then um, has that long kind of filament, again, when they're little. Um, a lot of these surgeons, like we talked about, they lack the scales um, of the more modern fish, like for instance, a carp has scales, but they have this cartilaginous skeleton um, and all the way down their back, their sides, their undersides. Um, so when you hold these fish, um, most of the time you have to wear gloves because of these spiny projections, but otherwise when you feel the fish, they're very soft and kind of squishy like a normal fish. Um, so these um, barbels that they have, we'll talk about these. It's really hard to see in this picture, but they are curved, not in a straight line. And then the two inner barbels are gonna be just a little bit shorter than the outer barbels. All right, um, the pallid versus the lake surgeon. So how do you know when, you, when you're when you fishing, let's say you catch one, um, you obviously don't want it to be a pallid surgeon. I mean, that's cool, but you gotta put it back right away because they are an endangered species. They look very similar to each other. So if you look at this photo here, this one on the very right is going to be a what? A shovel nose, good, because they are straight across and all the barbels are pretty much the same. It's very hard to tell because these are younger ones. This one over here um, is going to have shorter little barbels inside, so it's gonna be a pallid. So pallids have the broad flat snouts, they have the fringed barbels, four lobes on their lower lip, the caudal, um, their caudal peduncle, it has basically bony plates on it. Um, they're generally that whiter gray color. Um, they whiten as they get older. The lateral barbels are also much longer than the central barbels. All right, so palisturgeon reproduction. So like many other species, they're very long lived. They have a very high sexual maturity. These guys, not as bad as the lake sturgeon, um, but most of them do not reproduce until they're about seven to nine years old. Females, it takes them about nine to 15 years old. Pallid males will spawn every two to three years. Females are on a three to five year cycle. So it just depends on the age and the size. Um, they will move upstream in the late fall. They'll spawn in the spring and then the very early summer, which in Nebraska, it's about March through June. And then they'll spawn over open gravel beds or other hard 
bottom surfaces. The eggs take about five to eight days to hatch. Um, and these guys live a very long time. They can live 50, even 100 years old. All right, so these guys, their mouth is located way back from the tip of the snout. So again, here's a tip, here's their mouth is way back here. Um, they're generally bottom feeders like most of our other sturgeon. They lack the teeth, they suck up things like small fish, mollusks, worms, crustaceans, that kind of stuff. Um, they're, not a lot is known about their feeding habits. They're very old fish, but we just don't know a lot about them. They seem to be opportunistic. So whatever they can find, they're gonna eat. And then one study actually found that depends on the season and what's available, their diet will change. So they'll eat smaller fish when there's more fish available and they'll eat things like insect larvae when the insect larvae is available. So it just kind of depends on the season. All right, and then pallet sturgeon population status. So in Nebraska, they were listed as a federally endangered species in 1990. Um, this was due basically to extensive habitat modification, the channelization of the rivers, um, a lot of commercial harvest actually, and even that hybridization with those shovel nose sturgeon. Um, there has been a lot of recovery efforts for this species, um, more they think that when you look at a map of someone that says, okay, here's where we think our pallid sturgeons are, they actually think it's more than it is now because of these recovery efforts, which is great to hear. And then one of the things is that when people do um, fish for things like shovel nose sturgeon, you might get a pallet on your line. Um, look at it, enjoy it for a second, and then quickly put it back into the water and release it. So um, a, this is a huge thing about why you need to know the differences because um, a lot of anglers just simply don't know the difference. And having an endangered species and having a um, common species are two very different things. All right, so in Nebraska, um, the US Fish and Wildlife Service basically designated four recovery priority management areas is what they were called. One of them was on the length of the Missouri. So basically this includes the mouth of the Platte River. So recovery efforts basically wanted to protect um, them from harvest and protect their habitat. And basically the fish that are now being stocked in to supplement the wild population, they wanna protect those as well. So there's been a ton of research and monitoring studies done in Nebraska. Um, basically they're ensuring, um, Game and Parks is working with the Army Corps of Engineers, ensuring that the flow um, and the deeper channels, they deposit the sandbars. These are critical habitats for these pallid surgeon. So they need to make sure they get it right. They also are regulating the flow on the Missouri they're doing a lot of fish stocking. So we'll talk about this broodstock recovery effort to supplement those wild populations. They put in radio transmitters to make sure that they're using this type of habitat and can see their movement. And then there's also a lot of evidence that shows that the hatchery raised pallids are surviving, they're growing and they're reaching a reproductive maturity and now they're spawning. So this is really kind of our success story as far as one of our endangered species. All right, so I do wanna talk a little bit about like why these animals are so endangered. Um, a lot of people, not in Nebraska per se, but there are a lot of um, illegal poaching opportunities when it comes to um, caviar. So um, one of the things, I think I misplaced these, these should be switched here. But um, when we talk about caviar or the eggs of these sturgeon, sometimes they're called roe, um, they're one of the most highly prized eggs from any species comes from this beluga sturgeon. These are huge, huge, huge sturgeon. Um, in 1924, there was, um, someone counted all of these, um, but there was about 542 pounds of caviar that came from this one female. So um, a lot of people want them, they're a delicacy. There's another species in Russia that has this golden brown caviar and they called it the caviar of the czars. Um, so if you remember the czars in Russia, um, they were overthrown. And so it was kind of like a compliment at that time to that family. Um, the North American white sturgeon is also um, pretty prized, um, both for the meat and also the caviar. And that species can produce up to about 200 pounds of caviar. And also the lake sturgeon and the Atlantic sturgeon as well. All right, and then I went backwards here. So there's this thing called the Sturgeon Initiative, which the um, World Wildlife Fund has been working on. Um, they're one of the most endangered species of 
um, any animal on earth. They're on the basically the brink of extinction. There's a lot of flourishing caviar market. There's habitat loss. All of these things are happening. So when we talk about wildlife poaching and crime, a lot of people always talk about like elephant tusks and rhinos and tigers. It's things like sturgeon as well. Um, so about one third of all sturgeon meat and caviar products from these four countries, which are huge major contributors um, for sturgeon, Bulgaria, Romania, Serbia, Ukraine, one third of all that meat is sold illegally. So between 2016 and 2020, there was a study done. About 145 sturgeon samples were collected. Um, they ran isotope samples trying to determine where the sturgeon came from. They found that 27 were wild caught and they did not come from farms. And then as many as 214 cases of poaching came from Romania, Bulgaria, and the Ukraine during this four-year study. Um, so this is also a despite a complete ban on fishing and trade of wild sturgeon species. So it, it still is happening is basically it. So, so what is Nebraska doing as far as our bird stock effort and how are we, you know, such a recovery and a um, success story as far as these animals go? Well, we did something called brood stock. Um, so this was a study done from 2008 2008 until 2018. Um, so the Nebraska Game and Parks did a pallid sturgeon, what we call broodstock collection. Um, basically, it was just a need to get local reproductively ready pallid sturgeon. They got them to the hatcheries, they had them spawn and reproduce. And then what bit they wanted to do is restock those into the wild populations. Um, so the pallids would be spawned in the hatcheries. They would watch them until they reached about eight to 12 inches long. And then in the hopes that they would put them back in the Missouri in hopes that then they would go um, reproduce and spawn again. So um, basically that eight to 12 inches this ensured that they would make it as long as possible. There's a really high um, death rate as far as these animals go. Um, so it helped them kind of just get past that hard point and then put back into the river. Um, they're then restocked in the wild in hopes to supplement those wild fish populations. All right, so the study was done from 2008 to 2018. Um, there are four different sites that were used in Nebraska. Um, there was Plattsmouth North. Um, so if you get the city of Plattsmouth, you go north. The city of Plattsmouth, there was south. There's Nebraska City. And then I'm not sure what the last four site was. Um, we did some in Brownsville at one point, and then south of Brownsville, almost even into that Iowa, Missouri area. So this, um, whole thing was done by uh, Game and Park staff, mostly our fishery staff, but there was also volunteers. Um, so normal, common people, common citizens could do this. Um, there were 738 unique volunteers in this study during that 2008, 2018. There's, there was about 1800 days out on the river. There was about 19,000 hours of volunteer and Game and Park staff time. Over this time, there was 1,723 pallid sturgeon collected. Um, this just means that they were found. Not all of them went to the hatcheries. Only about 164 were reproductively ready. And then they were moved to the hatchery to then spawn. And then the wild populations would go back into the river. Um, with those 164 um, sturgeon, there was about 90,000 restocked into the Missouri. So that's a great number. Um, it wasn't just pallid sturgeon that we got. There was also the shovel nose and catfish and drum. Um, there are 40,359 other fish that were taken as well. They were measured and then put back. And then on average, just kind of a fun stat that Kirk gave me here, about 12,000 night crawlers were used every single year. That's a lot of night crawlers. And then 12 miles of trot line were used. So basically what they did, um, you can kind of see here, they put these lines up. Um, in the river in areas where we think pallid sturgeons would be. We put a hook on them, you put a worm in, you leave them sit overnight for 24 hours, you come back in the morning in the hopes that there would be fish attached to them. Sometimes there would, sometimes there wouldn't be. Um, a lot of shovel nose sturgeon, there were some catfish in there that were curious and wanted to eat the worms, but then there were also pallids as that is what we were looking for. So um, here's a couple of photos. Basically, they would take these buckets. These are all hooks. Um, they would clamp onto the trot lines. And then on each single one of these, there is a worm attached to the bottom um, so that the animal would bite the worm and then get stuck on the hook. 
Um, you would then, like I said, you put them back in the river where we hoped that pallid surgeon would be. You pull them up the next day and in the hopes that there would be fish attached. Um, you can see there's some that are dangling and then there's some that tried to get away and you can see the line is really tangled. So you have to kind of flip them around to get them off. Um, we would put them all in this huge bucket. Um, so every single line, you know, sometimes you would get one, sometimes you might get 26 of them, you never know. Um, you can also see like on here, there's that long filamentous tail um, on some of these as well. Not all of them would have it. There's a lot of shovel nose sturgeon in here. And then each fish, we would measure it, we would weigh it, and we record them. So here's weighing, oftentimes they're larger than the scale, which is fine, that's good. And then we would also run one of these little, um, kind of like a tag reader. It basically is looking to see if this animal has already been tagged. Um, it would, you would run this over, oftentimes it would beep. That means that there's a, a, a tag in that animal. If it didn't beep, then there wasn't one. If there was a pallid sturgeon and we didn't see a tag, we would put a tag in it. So again, this looks like it would hurt the animal. It just simply goes under the skin. You run the wand over it, it reads a certain number. Um, and then you can see where that animal is going. So it's kind of a cool process. You just slip a little tiny grain of rice tag under here, you pull it out, and then you put the animal back. And then we would release them back into the water. You can see here's all the hooks as well. Took a lot of volunteer hours. All right, so that was kind of our reproductive success as far as our pallid surgeon. Um, so I hope that you guys learned a lot about our three different types that we have in Nebraska, our recovery efforts that we've done, and often and honestly just a really good success story when it comes to our sturgeon, especially our pallid sturgeon. All right, so like I said, this was our very, very last um, science of for the year. We'll start back up again in August. So we're gonna have, uh, was it seven, six new different topics here? Everything from amphibians to spiders, migration, lots of different types of things. Um, for those of you that really liked this and would like to watch it again or maybe share it with a friend, it will be up on our Game and Parks YouTube channel. Um, probably give us till at least Monday um, and then it should be up there under the playlist Science Of. And you can also watch all the previous ones. We have things like turtles, we have um, um, animal love, we have animal tongue, bites and stings. There's lots of different types of things that you can watch. And also, if you really like this, please like our education Facebook page. We have an Instagram page. And then we also have Nebraska Wildlife Education website as well. All right. Are there any questions? I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. But yes. There is the one uh, where were the adults released after one spawning or kept for many years? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I assume that maybe they were only kept for one or two, especially some of those females that would only spawn every three to six years. Um, so I'm guessing only one or two at the most. Good question. I don't think Kirk is on. He could definitely answer that. Nope, he's not, so. All right. Well, that's all that I have. So thank you again for joining us. Um, I will be sending out an evaluation to everyone that registered with the email that you registered. Um, just kind of asking, you know, for any feedback. And then there is kind of a thank you incentive for um, filling out an evaluation. And we always appreciate any feedback. Otherwise, I'll stay on for maybe about 30 more seconds. But thank you. Have a great weekend. And I appreciate everyone coming out. Thank you, Jamie, very much, too. Thanks for having me, Monica. Yeah, thank you. Have a good